Okay, um, well, given that we're tight on time, we might start. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever everybody is. Uh, my name is Duncan Watson. Uh, for the next couple of days or the next couple of weeks, I'm one of the co-chairs of HK45 before I, I step down from that position. Um, and it is my great pleasure to, to welcome you all to this joint webinar between HK45 and Young ICSID on careers in investment arbitration in Asia. Before I hand over to our moderator, I just want to start with a few words on HK45. We are the group for young arbitration practitioners in Hong Kong, uh, but uh, we're, we're open and very keen for people from all around the world to join, not just those based in Hong Kong or the PRC. Our purpose is really to build up the arbitration community in Hong Kong and in the region by providing opportunities like this for, for younger members of, of the profession to meet each other, to learn from each other, to, to share their skills and, and their experiences. For instance, apart from, from this webinar, we have a, a series of fireside chats with senior female practitioners from around the world who share their journeys, their, their advice, their experiences, um, in, in what's been a really interesting series. And, uh, and our next one is this Friday, featuring Catherine Mun from Lee and Partners. So please join us for, for that. One silver lining from, from all of this pandemic stuff that we've been going through this year is the widespread use of web, the webinar format, like, like this one, which has really helped in facilitating cross-border communication and, and community building. So, it, it, that has really uh, facilitated us working with Young Ixid, which we're very pleased to do. We're really looking forward to hearing from our panelists today and doing more with Young Ixid in the future. I just have one quick um, housekeeping point, which is that this session right now is the webinar format. We'll go to 9.45 Hong Kong time, so in about 45 minutes. When that finishes, everybody has a separate link to join for the Q&A and the, the sort of virtual networking. So during this session, please feel free to send in um, written questions using the chat function, but we'll probably hold those over to the last 15 minutes on the other link. So on that note, I'll hand over to our very impressive and interesting moderator, uh, Geraldine Fisher. Thank you so much, Duncan. On behalf of ICSID, I would like to also welcome all of you to the inaugural Young ICSID HK45 event. We hope that this will be the first of many events that we will host together. Um, my name is Geraldine Fisher, and today I will be moderating the discussion on how to develop a career in investment arbitration in Asia. Um, one important rule that we follow at our ICSID events is that you can use the information received today, but you may not reveal the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers, nor that of any other participant from today's webinar. So for this session, we have a great group of professionals who have all worn different hats in this field, working as counsel, academics, treaty negotiators, arbitrators, and institutional counsel. Each of these experiences enriches our perspectives and gives us the skills to succeed in our roles. So one important takeaway from today's talk is that there are many different paths to finding a fulfilling career in investment arbitration. So I've worked in this field for about 20 years. I started my career in the US government advising on trade and investment issues and negotiating free trade and investment agreements. I then went to work at a firm to see how these treaties were actually used in practice. At the firm, I represented both foreign investors and states in treaty arbitrations and also in US courts. Next, I moved to Singapore, where I worked as a senior research fellow at the Center for International Law, which is part of the National University of Singapore. And there I published papers and designed trainings on ASEAN investment issues. And now um, I am at ICSID where I've been for the last eight years and I've acted as secretary to the tribunal in almost 40 arbitration proceedings under the ICSID convention, the additional facility um, and also on CITRAL rules. In addition to case management, I also work on institutional projects 
One of my favorite projects so far has been to co-edit Ixit's 50th anniversary book, which I always have a copy on at my, at my <laughs> table. Um, so now I wanna take this chance to uh, introduce you to our wonderful panelists who have all had interesting careers in arbitration in Asia. And I will start off with Duncan. So Duncan Watson is a partner in Quinn Emanuel's Hong Kong office. He has been widely praised for his exceptional advocacy skills and he has been described by his peers as one of the best of his generation. He has worked all over the world as counsel in international commercial and investment treaty arbitrations. He has also acted as arbitrator and regularly publishes and lectures on commercial and investment treaty arbitration in Asia. He is qualified in both Australia and England and Wales. Next, we have um, Professor Tomoko Ishikawa. Professor Ishikawa began her career as a judge in the Tokyo District Court. After completing her LLM at the University of Oxford and PhD at University College London, um, Professor Ishikawa became a trade negotiator for Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where she worked on investment treaties, free trade agreements, and WTO dispute settlement. Um, Tomoko has since transitioned to academia and she now teaches at Nagoya University. Professor Ishikawa has been named to various institutional panels as arbitrator, and she is also on the ICSID panel for conciliators. Professor Ishikawa has published a multitude of articles in prestigious journals in the field of investment arbitration. And our third panelist is Dr. Ling Yang. She is the Secretary General of Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, and she is the Chief Representative of the Shanghai Office. Dr. Yang was previously an Associate Professor at the East China University of Political Science and Law, where she taught international arbitration for more than eight years. Dr. Yang has published widely on international dispute resolution and arbitration in China, and she has also been appointed as arbitrator. She obtained her PhD in 2009 and an LLM in international law in 2006 from Wuhan University. So without further ado, I will now ask each of the panelists to talk to us a little bit more about their career path, specifically what piqued their interest in the area and how they got started in the field. So we'll start off with Duncan. Thanks, Geraldine. So I am Australian, as you can probably tell from my accent. And I did my undergrad um, legal studies at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. Um, from there, I did about a year and a half clerking for a judge in our state Supreme Court. Um, and that, as we were just talking about before the session started, is in my view, one of the best ways to start for any young professional in at least the common law world that works slightly differently in other parts of the world uh, who are interested in a career in dispute resolution in terms of mentorship and experience. It, it really was one of the best experiences of my professional life. Um, from there, I did a year and a half at a commercial firm in, in Brisbane. And then I left Australia uh, to go to Oxford for a year to do the BCL. Um, from there, I wanted to stay uh, in, in England. So I moved to, to London and joined Quinn Emanuel. Um, that was 10 years ago, I've been with the firm ever since. Um, first five years as an associate and, and the last five years as a partner. Um, uh, Quinn Emanuel, you, you may know, is, is a disputes resolution only firm. So we only do disputes, we, we don't do other um, areas of the law. And so when I first started, I was a more general litigator and it took me a few months or years to, to sort of transition into being a, an arbitration specialist. And what really um, drew me to that area uh, in particular was really the, the opportunities to do more of the written and oral advocacy. In, as a lot of people here probably know, in, in England and in Australia, there's a, a split profession. And so in domestic litigation, the, the solicitors firms don't generally get involved in that side of the advocacy. Whereas in, in arbitration, at least in my firm, we do, and that was something that really attracted me to that area. Um, I, I, I was in our London office for a few years, in our Sydney office for a few years, and I've been in Hong Kong now for about five. Um, throughout all of that time, I've really focused on a mixture of commercial and investment arbitration, and that mixture is something that 
I think has been important for my career and is something that, that we might come back to a bit later. Um, currently in my office, what we do is um, generally, uh, there's a focus on Asian disputes, whether it's our client being Asian, uh, an Asian company or an Asian individual, or the seat of the arbitration or, or the, the, the substantive law being Hong Kong law or, or somewhere else in Asia, Korean law, for instance. Um, so I think that, that that's me in a nutshell. Can I just ask a quick, quick question for the Asian clients? When you talk about Asian clients, is it all over Asia? Like, is it also? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So it, the answer is yes. So we have a lot of Hong Kong and PRC based clients, but also clients in Korea in particular. Korea is a, a, a busy market for, for arbitration, both investment arbitration and, and commercial arbitration and wider around the region. But I would say those three in particular. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, so next we have Tomoko, who's going to just give us a little bit about her background and how she got started on all of this. Thank you, Jerry, for your kind introduction. I thank you on behalf of my parents. <laughs> <laughs> just, just one correction, I went to Cambridge, not to... Oh, <laughs> oh sorry. <laughs> but like... <laughs> And so I started my career as a domestic court judge, as Jerry mentioned, in Tokyo District Court, where I dealt with like cases based on civil codes that encompass contracts law, tort law, and family law, as well as company law. And then uh, after three years, I went to Cambridge to do master in laws, and that, that actually changed my career. And uh, where like I took a course on international arbitration, including investment arbitration, taught by like Professor Crawford, Lord Mastio, and Professor Jan Paulson, and it was so interesting, like you can imagine. And <laughs> like what was most attract attractive to me is that like I I came to realize that if you are very very capable, you can practice international law while being an academic. Mm. So like that was not like, you know, common, not at all common in the Japanese judiciary. So I decided to quit the judiciary and proceeded to do my doctoral thesis at UCL under the supervision by Professor Catherine Redwell and Professor Zachary Douglas. And uh, when I completed my PhD, I came back to Japan for family reasons. And uh, I joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan where I was engaged in uh, negotiations of bilateral investment treaties and uh, trilateral investment treaties between Japan, China, and South Korea, as well as free trade agreements. I also did a bit of WTO dispute settlement cases. And I stayed there for two years. Then I joined the academia. And uh, now like, I am involved in uh, several research projects. And uh, one of them is a, I started a joint research project with the BICO, like British Institute of International and Comparative Law on cybersecurity issues and economic globalization. So that's what I'm doing now. And I will hand it over to Lin. <laughs> okay, great. So if Ling, Ling, would you like to talk a little bit about your background? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the organize, organizer, Hong Kong 45 and Yang Yixid. And uh, many thanks for all the attendees today here. So this is Ling from the HKSC Shanghai office. So good morning, everyone. And uh, as, as uh, Jerry just uh, introduced that, uh, I graduated from Wuhan University Private International Law uh, as a PhD. And then I joined a uh, leading law school in China uh, there uh, where I uh, have been teaching international economic law and the international arbitration for actually for more than 12 years right now. And uh, so the two main courses I have been uh, teaching, uh, uh, there are uh, international economic law where the investment arbitration and the investment, uh, uh, international investment law are uh, very uh, big part of that. And uh, uh, for the postgraduate, I have been teaching international arbitration for, 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 many, many, for many years. And the uh, most interesting that uh, from 2013 and 2014, I was sitting as a judge in Shanghai Pudong District Court. 
and in the number four civil division. And uh, uh, as the role as a judge, I have been handling more than 20 foreign, China foreign related cases, commercial cases there. And uh, three years ago, I mean, uh, since January, 2018, I joined HPIC as the Deputy Secretary General and the Chief Representative of the Shanghai office. The main jobs for me, I mean, the role, the, my role at HPIC is to dealing with the HPIC's matters related, uh, involved Chinese parties. For example, uh, the cases management involved Chinese parties, the arbitrators involved Chinese parties, and uh, uh, to uh, design the training courses for men and Chinese practitioners, and also designed uh, courses for Chinese students. So, so the generally, to see my role at HKC is to get help help HKC to get more visibility in HKC. Uh, in addition to my role at HKC, and actually since 2012. I have been appointed as an arbitrator in PRC domestic arbitration institutions. And the most of my cases are commercial uh, uh, disputes and uh, where I was appointed as, uh, by institution, by parties, as a presenting arbitrator, sole arbitrator, and uh, co-arbitrator. And uh, uh, my understanding is that my contribution for today's event is that I'm not give a good example of uh, how to develop a career in investment arbitration, because frankly, I have no direct uh, uh, experience in investment arbitration, but just the indirect uh, experience in, in the investment arbitration at HKIC, because HKIC has been handling two investment arbitration cases over the years. And so today I will give some uh, answer, maybe answer some questions from uh, a perspective of a Chinese practitioners, how to uh, develop a career in investment arbitration. Okay, thank you. That would be great. Thank you so much. Yeah. So the, so the next question that I know everybody wants to know is, what is your typical day? So I guess we'll start off with Duncan. And I know sometimes there is no typical day. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to give us a little bit of idea, what exactly do you do day to day? Sure. I mean, there's not a typical day, but one thing that I generally start my days off doing is waking my two-year-old, feeding and uh, dressing him. And I say that partly jokingly, but also partly because I think it's important to, to acknowledge that I have these other responsibilities as a parent and that um, and, and we all do on, on this panel. And it's important, I think, to, to balance our professional obligations with, with those. And that's something that's important to me and, and that I've tried to do, maybe not always successfully. So after that, um, when I'm at my desk, um, my, my caseload really runs the, the range from cases that are just starting or even in the, the initial advice phase right up to hearing or post-hearing um, stages. So two weeks ago, I had a hearing, a, a merits hearing in Hong Kong, and we're de dealing with the, the post hearing stuff with that. Now, uh, this week I have uh, a, a, the initial procedural conference for a new case. Um, so it, at any given stage, I might be preparing for a hearing or speaking to witnesses or experts to prepare their witness statements or writing um, angry but professional letters back and forth. <laughs> Um, and, and working closely with my team in Hong Kong. We have a small team in Hong Kong, but also with co-counsel around the region. I think that's a, a really important part of my practice, whether they're in Korea or the PRC uh, or, or elsewhere um, and other offices within my firm. So, so that often means calls late at night or early in the morning. Um, but I think that's a, a really important part of my practice and really this field generally. And how big are your teams when you run a case, just out of curiosity? Uh, that, that's a real mix as well. So the merits hearing I did two weeks ago was just me and an associate in Hong Kong. So it was just the two of us. Um, last year, I was in a six week hearing that had a team of about 20 or 25 mm. from four offices around my network. So it really um, ranges from very small to very large. Okay. And your co-counsel is all over all over the world, well, all over Asia? Particularly in Asia. So I have um, a couple of large Korean cases at the moment, um, some shareholder disputes and an, an investment treaty dispute against Korea. 
where I'm working closely with co-counsel in Korea to, to different firms. Um, but over the years, I've worked with uh, PRC firms and Philippine firms and, and others around the region. Okay, great. Thank you. And so now I'll turn to Tomoko and find out what, what a typical day in the life of an academic is. Right. So like, I, like, like Duncan, like my day starts with looking after my kids. Yeah. So, but like, like, Dan, like, as Duncan said, like, it is very important, like, to remind me of like, what is important in your life. And like, your career is important, but at the same time, you need to enjoy the other side of your life, too. So like, after like seeing my kids off to school, I start working at around like 8am. So this year, for obvious reasons, I mostly worked from home, but I go to my university to attend faculty meetings about once a week. So weekdays are typically spent on lecturing, reading my students' thesis for supervision, reviewing articles that I peer review for journals, and preparing my lectures. So at my university, the submission deadline for master's thesis is January. So at this moment, I'm snowed under with supervision work. <laughs> then I take a break in the afternoon when my kids come back home and I resume work after dinner. So when I have web meetings with people in the United States, Europe and Asia, I often have to stay up until midnight. But I typically do my research work in evenings, in the evenings and on weekends. So life an academic, as an academic is pretty busy. Sounds very busy. <laughs> And what kind, what kind of areas are you researching now? So like my one research project is national security and economic globalization, the tension between them. And the other project, the important project, my sole project is the corporate social responsibility and the investment arbitration or investment dispute settlement. So I have two major big research projects right now. Those are, those are very topical issues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay, so I'll, I'll move to Ling now so she can tell us what, what a typical day in the life of the Deputy Secretary General of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center is like. Especially in, Shang, in the Shanghai office. In okay. the Shanghai so, office. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, that's most important for my role here. And uh, so firstly, emails, and uh, I, uh, I'm handling all of my works with my Hong Kong colleagues through emails and uh, uh, to involve the uh, case uh, discussion uh, through emails or, or thousands of emails every day. And then phone calls with the different uh, organizations in China, PRC China. I mean, for example, uh, uh, I, I should communicate with the, uh, the Supreme People's Court about the different arrangement between the China and Hong Kong. For example, recently the intramayor arrangement. So every month I should report to the development of the arrangement uh, the, the enforcement of arrangement to the SPC. And uh, 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 then I, I, I will prepare the different speakings before law firms, uh, lawyers associations, uh, universities, or other institutions. And in the same time, I should prepare for the different events organized by HKIC or joint events uh, between HKIC and other institutions in mainland China. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I also, as a mentor at the eCouple, East China University of Science and Law, and uh, 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 like uh, the Tomoko, the, uh, the winter is a busy uh, uh, season for, for all the professors in the universities because all the students will get the thesis debate uh, in the coming spring. So I should uh, give some suggestions to their thesis writing. And uh, uh, for my personal uh, interest, I also uh, like to write in something about the new developments in, in international arbitration and uh, get it for the publication. So, yeah, very busy. Uh, all the, uh, I'm a two girls mother too, but uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like everybody's a little busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the next question I'll ask are, what skills have you found to be the most useful for your current role? And we'll start again with Duncan. Good question. So I think there are a couple of things. Firstly, I think writing with clarity and um, simplicity is really critical in, in what I do, but probably in what everybody does on, on this call. I think that that's absolutely critical because we're in the business of 
communicating and persuading. Um, secondly, I think the ability to synthesize a lot of complex material and cut through it and distill it down to what is really important um, and then to explain that in writing or orally is really critical. Mm. And, and finally, I would say uh, the ability to stay flexible and to stay calm. <laughs> because Those are great in, characters. In what every, in every, right. I mean, in what everybody on the call does, but particularly uh, when you're acting as counsel in a hearing or, or dealing with clients, you're constantly thrown uh, new and difficult and unexpected twists and it's a it can be very stressful and I think for the sake of yourself and your client and your team and, and really everybody the ability to stay flexible to roll with those changes and to deal with things calmly and respectfully I think is, is really important. Mm, agreed yeah um, and the writing skills that you mentioned is that something that you honed in practice or was that from your studies? What advice would you give for like a young lawyer? Cause I know that's often something that people would like to improve. I think, well, I would say particularly in practice, um, not so much in, in, in my studies, although that was important as well. The one piece of advice that I give to all of my associates when, when I'm talking about this question, how do you improve your writing is to read and to read as wildly, uh, widely and diversely as you can. So don't just limit yourself to, to court judgments or arbitral awards, but read fiction and The New Yorker or, or The New York Times or The Guardian or, or whatever. Just to, and read constantly and widely because in my view, that's the best way to improve your own writing, to see how others do it and to absorb those different styles and what works and what doesn't work. No, that's a great tip. That's a great tip. Um, so I'll move on to Tomoko now. So what skills have you have you found to be the most useful um, for your work in academia? Right. So that, that's a difficult question, but I think the skills required for academics have actually shifted in the last couple of decades from those of a knowledge provider to those of a knowledge creator because of the internet and many AI-based research services, search services covering specific areas of law, we think academics are not anymore in a better position to provide timely and the right information. So therefore developing skills of critical analysis and uh, pre providing innovative yet cautious thinking have become even more critical for academics. So like I'm telling you this because I, as you are aware, progressive development of law has been advanced by many practic practitioners, practicing lawyers, present novel arguments before courts and tribunals in actual proceedings. An example would be the invocation of the American 200 year old alien tort statute in the context of pursuing multinational responsibility by the lawyers representing the Burmese, Burmese local people in the UNOCAL case. So I think one of the important roles of academics is to be the inspiration for such developments by practicing lawyers. So speaking of my own experience, like a couple of years ago, an arbitrator asked me to send my article on provisional application of investment treaties, which I published in Mixed Review stating that he thought it would be relevant to a major issue in an ongoing investment arbitration case in which he was sitting as an arbitrator. So that was a rewarding, very rewarding experience uh, for me as an academic. So I think like that as an, like being an inspirator is a very important function of an academic. That's, that's great, thank you so much. Ling, what skill sets have you found to be the most useful? So as, uh, as my role at HKIC, I found that those, uh, at least the three skills are most helpful uh, in my role at HKIC. The first one is uh, the knowledge about uh, the international arbitration. I understand some of the attendees today are from mainland China, and uh, some of them are students and young practitioners here. And uh, I, I know it's not easy for most of uh, Chinese students or young practitioners. It's easy to get the international arbitration knowledge, what is the best practice, 
uh, in international arbitration. But for me, I think the knowledge about international arbitration, especially related to Chinese practice, I mean, the PRC arbitration practice, and the culturally, uh, it's very important. And the second skills, uh, I, I think the knowledge about the arbitration community in, in mainland China, in Hong Kong, in Asia Pacific region, I think it's quite important for me. Uh, uh, for example, every, uh, 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 every year, uh, HPIC Shanghai Office we are organized a number of events in PRC China, and uh, I, I, I always uh, looking for uh, some uh, top practitioners in Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, in Asia Pacific to speak on behalf of HPIC to train the uh, PRC young practitioners. So know the community, know the people. It's quite important for for my role at HPIC. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, uh, lastly, I think the communication skills or organizational skills uh, are critical uh, for my role because uh, I, I should communicate with the different people with the different background from the super duper court to the different law firms, lawyers, and from the professors to students, from the, the uh, policy decision makers and the, to the uh, policemen even. And so, so it's quite complicated that, I mean, in, in my role in Shanghai. So I think this is my role. And in addition to that, because you know that I, I was sitting as an arbitrator for over uh, 80 years. I think uh, as a Chinese arbitrator, uh, I mean, the most important skill is to understand the Chinese law, of course, and the, and the arbitration. Because the, the, the difference between the international arbitration, I mean, for example, Hong Kong arbitration and the domestic PRC arbitration is totally different. So for me, so I always shift from the oh, Hong Kong arbitration, okay, to the domestic arbitration. So, so I'm yeah. curious, what are some of those differences? I'm just very curious. Okay, for example, in international, in Hong Kong arbitration, as an arbitrator, drafting the, the procedure order is the uh, daily work. Every day you should draft the procedure order. But in domestic PRC arbitration uh, institution, as an arbitrator, so for most of cases, you need to drop the procedure order because all the procedure issues are handled by the institution, the council of the PRC domestic arbitration institution. Mm -hmm. But as an arbitration practitioner, I always sensitive to the procedure issues. So for me, so, so I always handle the different uh, procedure issues to communicate with the council of the domestic arbitration institutions and uh, uh, and to HPIC internal cases. Okay, so, you know, so big differences. Yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so yeah. now I just want to find out a little bit more about how your prior experience um, has impacted your current role. So, Duncan, what are some of the differences between practicing in Hong Kong versus your practice in Sydney and London? I know you've practiced all over. I have, and, and there are similarities and differences. So in, in, in terms of similarities, ultimately at its core, the work is the same. So it's it's just about legal analysis as, as rigorously and as carefully as you can uh, the fact finding and applying the law to the facts and then working out how to communicate that analysis simply and, and persuasively. Um, one of the big differences that I found moving to this part of the world from England is that um, the cultural issues at play in, in cases, but also my work um, in, even just in the office are much more prominent um, and, and much more important. Um, there's a lot more diversity in this part of the world. We talk, I've, and I'm guilty of this, I've talked about Asia. We're talking, when we talk about Asia, we're talking about two or three billion people from hugely diverse backgrounds <clears throat> with huge cultural differences between them, let alone between um, those Asian cultures and, and, and the West. So I would say that those cultural differences or the role of cultural differences is one of the, the big differences um, in, in my practice now, as, as opposed to a few years ago when I was in London. Uh, I would also say that in this part of the world, I think there are greater opportunities for practitioners, certainly younger practitioners. It's a growing and developing field in a way that it's not in, in Europe. So I, I would say that in Europe, it's much more settled and established. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, in Asia, it's new, it's vibrant. There are lots more opportunities to 
um, do interesting work, to make a name for yourself, to, to forge a, a new path for yourself, I think, uh, in a way that in, in Europe it's much harder. Oh, that, that's very interesting. So it's a growth area in this very part much. of the world. Very much. Okay. Okay, so I will ask um, Tomoko, how has your role as a former negotiator impacted your work as an academic? Okay, so I, I think like my experiences at the MOFPA are like guide me to be more cautious perhaps when interpreting treaty provisions. Like, as I said, progressive development of law has often occurred through innovative arguments presented by lawyers representing disputing parties. And inspiring them is an important function of academics, I believe. But having said that, these developments are sometimes controversial, like in the context of investment arbitration, like for example, the use of an most favored nation clause to incorporate more favorable provisions in other investment treaties after the Mafazenia world perhaps, perhaps might have come as a surprise to certain members of the investment law community. And cases such as Abaculat versus Argentina, which allowed a class action for claims arising from sovereign bonds governed by foreign law, like our euro bonds, may likewise surprise some states. So if you have experience in treaty negotiations as a government official, you will understand firsthand its quid or pro quo nature. And you might be a bit more cautious in adopting an expansive interpretation of investment treaty provisions, especially when it concerns the jurisdiction of the tribunal, which must be based on clear consent by the parties. But like, I have to say that I'm not by any means representing the Japanese government's position <laughs> in the, on these matters, nor am I suggesting that my experience in the ministry has guided me to be more contro uh, <laughs> conservative. Mm -hmm. But like, Rather, like, indeed, my, in certain contexts, my experience may help to assess the explanations, memorials submitted by the defendant states more critically. And uh, I am also an ardent supporter of the principle of evolutive interpretation, which sometimes creates tension with the original intention of the state parties. What I mean is that my professional experience guides me to cautiously judge the scope for evolutive or acrobatic dynamic interpretations. And uh, speaking of my like experience in the judiciary, maybe like it is particular to the Japanese judiciary, but the judges, Japanese judges do play an active role in, uh, in court settlements. So mm -hmm. for example, judges in courts of first instance often encourage the disputing parties to come to an uh, amicable settlement, and also suggest conditions and terms. This role played by Japanese judges is perhaps similar to that of conciliators and mediators, so mm -hmm. unlikely differs from the role of the judiciary in common law countries. So that I, I thought that can, can be interesting. Like, no, that's very interesting, and I see Ling is shaking her head yes because she was <laughs> also a judge. So right, maybe she right. can talk yes. to us a little bit about that as well. And that is true. Uh, as far as I know, the Chinese judge always uh, like to push to, or encourage the parties to reach uh, agreement before the formal proceedings. So this is kind of an internal, uh, I mean, the, the, for the Chinese court, there is an internal, uh, I mean, the assessment to the judges or workload. For example, how many cases you have encouraged the parties to reach agreement before the formal uh, pro, uh, court proceedings. So this is one thing I want to follow up with Tomoko. And back to the Duncan's uh, thing, I, I want to give more comments about the Asia and the investment arbitration. And uh, all of today's uh, topic is careers in, in international uh, investment arbitration in Asia. So I, 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 my understanding is that Asia is, a, for most of Asia parties, uh, investment arbitration is a new thing. We can see the case note from ICSIT that for Chinese parties over the years, only seven cases administered by ICSIT where Chinese parties act as a claimant. 
and only five cases are missed by exceed where Chinese, Chinese government actors uh, responded. So just the, uh, uh, based on the number of case notes of the Chinese parties involved in exceed, we can see that investment arbitration is a totally new thing. I mean, for most of Asia parties, but I should say that Asia is an emerging market for investment arbitration, not only for the investor, Asia investor, but also for the Asia countries. So for example, China's Belt and Road Initiative over the several years, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, outbound and inbound uh, from China and in and go out of China. And uh, uh, SOEs, Chinese SOEs invested a lot in Africa countries and the Southeast Asia. And uh, this year due to the pandemic, I heard that some contract has problem in different countries. But uh, for most of the Chinese parties, they have no very clear map or strategy to use investment arbitration. So for, for, for I mean, for the practitioners in Asia Pacific region, so uh, just from my personal perspective, I think uh, uh, in the future, uh, the, the investment arbitration involving Chinese parties is a uh, will become a big thing. This is one thing. But another background, I should say that generally the Chinese lawyers will not represent Chinese uh, foreign investor in suing Chinese government. This is a cultural thing. Yeah. So for those who want mm -hmm. represent a foreign investor in suing Chinese parties, the chance to do in the big law firms like Queen Menu, something like this. So. For, for, for those who want to move to Hong Kong or move to Asia. So this is a kind of, uh, you know, potential here, a, a, a great potential here, yeah. I mean, so, I can, yeah. that's really interesting. I can tell you from the ICSID perspective, we've seen a lot more cases brought by Asian investors. Um, so we have cases by Singaporean investors, Japanese investors, Chinese investors, Korean investors. So, and there's also been a lot more cases in this region as well. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think there is room and there are a lot of um, local law firms that have also started to mm -hmm. not only partner with the international firms, but they've also been bringing cases on their own. Right. So I guess we have very little time left. So I'll ask our final question. Um, so what advice would you give to a law student looking to create a career in investment arbitration generally and in Asia specifically? And I just wanted to add one thing that ICSID a few years ago started an internship program, um, which has been great. We've gotten students from all over the world. Um, they are third year law students, LLMs, PhDs, including PhDs from China and some students from Japan. Um, and even during the pandemic, we've also been holding remotely. So that's just something that I wanna highlight from our institution. So I'll turn, I guess, Duncan is our number one speaker. So he'll go Duncan, then Tomoko, and then Ling to I follow have, our order. I have a lot of thoughts about this. So feel free to cut me off. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that we don't have too much time. So the first thing I would say is that luck does play a big part in this um, and, and there's, there's only so much you can do about that. What you can do is try to create and seek out opportunities to, to build a career in, in this field. And there are a couple of aspects to that. One, I think realistically as a practitioner, it's important to be in the right firm that, that does this sort of work, but also the right office within uh, that firm. There, there are huge differences between individual partners and individual offices in terms of what, what their practice actually looks like. Secondly, it's important to try to seek out the right people, not just necessarily the big headline, um, you know, headline grabbing practice leaders, but the sort of people who will mentor you and, and look out for you and make sure that you're learning and developing. Um, and that may or may not be rare in big law firms, I won't comment on that. <laughs> Um, also, I think it's important to seek out the right sort of cases. And again, it's not, it's not just about the big headline grabbing cases. It's about smaller cases where you can develop your skills in a more hands-on way, you know, being one of the, the two member team rather than one of the 25 member team. Um, how, how do you do that? I think that you do need to try to distinguish yourself. 
one one way to do that is through further education. And I think everybody on, on this call has done that. In my experience, I was told quite um, openly that the only reason I got an interview with Quinn Emanuel was because I'd done the year at Oxford. Um, I would also say it's important to just meet people, um, come to events like this um, in person when we're able to do all of that again, reach out to people at, at firms. You'd be surprised how many people are, are just willing to meet for a coffee or engage by email. Then I think it's about, so it's not just about seeking out and creating opportunities, it's about making the most of them. And again, I'm, I'm sort of on a, a high horse at the moment, so stop me if, if we, we're running out of time. But if, if you're in a law firm, it's important to understand that law firms act, that there's a sort of internal market within law firms and everybody who's senior to you, whether they're a senior associate or a partner is your client and you need to treat them like that. And the way that you do that is by making yourself in, invaluable, by working really hard, by producing the best kind of work, not, so not being too picky about the sort of work that you do. And I think that's a, a really important uh, piece of advice that I can give because, okay, investment arbitration is very interesting. It's very topical. It, it can be quite sexy, but it's also the, the opportunities in that field are quite few and they're quite narrow. And the way that you get there is by doing all sorts of cases, particularly the commercial cases, because 98% of all arbitrations around the world are commercial. And the skills in those cases are absolutely transferable to investment cases. It's all about the analysis, the communication, the preparing for hearings, the advice, uh, the cross-examination, all of that. Um, you might not get too much choice in terms of the work that you do. And as a junior associate, you don't want to be, you don't want to get a reputation as being too precious or, or only saving yourself for, for one particular kind of work. As I said, it's all about internal marketing and you want to become the go-to person. And the way that you do that is by taking on as much as you can and making the most of all of that, those opportunities. And investment cases, are generally very big, they're very high stakes, they're very fact driven. Um, and that means that there are often very big teams on them, which makes it very hard to distinguish yourself as a junior and to do the sort of work that will develop your skills in the way that you might get more in a smaller, uh, smaller case in a smaller team. I'm gonna stop and take a breath, and let somebody <laughs> else speak um, if we have time or if we have to switch to the, 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 the chat. I think I think we're um, if anybody else wants to say something quickly, we're about time to switch. To, what is it called? The session. <laughs> and I just wanted to uh, Duncan's tips were excellent. Um, Tomoko and Ling, I don't know if you wanted to add anything or if we should stop and then we move on to the second portion. I think we can move on to the Q&A session if Ling agrees. Great. OK, so I guess now we will log off of the webinar every anybody correct me please and then move on to the q a session which will then convert into the networking event okay 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 so see everybody in a little bit <laughs>